Um, today's lecture certainly places the world at our doorstep. It's a special pleasure to welcome back to the Schemmel Forum a trusted friend and colleague, Elzbieta Matinia. Elzbieta is a professor of sociology and director of the Transregional Center for Democratic Studies at the New School in New York City. She runs an institute each year on democracy for young scholars, both in Poland and in South Africa. Elzbieta was a 2011 Fulbright Scholar in South Africa and the author of Transformative Democracy, published in, 19, in 2010. At present, she's working on a very important project in the study of emerging democracies in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. She's translating and editing conversations between two of the world's leading architects of post-communist democracy, the late Czech president Václav Havel and Adam Miknik, one of the founders of the Solidarity Movement in Poland, a movement that emboldened the rest of Central and Eastern Europe to throw off its shackles. That book will be called Havel Miknik, The Uncanny Era of Post-Communism. We'll have to get that one. Elzbieta has just returned from an international conference at, on the Arab Spring at Harvard called Women Make Democracy. I imagine that that recent experience will inform her talk today. So please join me in welcoming Elzbieta Matinia. I have a very strong voice, so even if this doesn't work, and I guess it doesn't, I think you will hear me. <laughs> um, and I also wanted to show some images. Um, and to do that, I just have to make sure that I know how to put it on, display on projector. Here, here we are. The title of, the, uh, of my presentation today is The Greening of Democracy. I will be talking about Arab Spring, but I will, um, as you will see very, very, very quickly, I will also refer to other places in the world in which um, something quite new is happening. Where does one find solidarity those days? Not in the parliaments, not in the parliament buildings, not in the government offices, but on the city squares, in the swarm, as my former pro professor, um, uh, now teaching in, uh, uh, at Oxford, Zygmunt Bauman says, indeed swarm, through, though it does have shape, is otherwise rather structureless. From the point of view of an outsider, it hardly seems organized. It does not need leaders or even surgeons. Indeed, a swarm is an apt metaphor for the kind of corrective behavior that more and more we see around the world, that we are witnessing recently on urban squares around the world. People congregate to move there, they migrate in the same direction, but without any, necessarily, any central uh, coordination. From Romania to Bahrain, from Moscow to New York, globally, this new breed of social movements is challenging the powers that be. The causes of the movements are quite complex and different. The challenges they face, the problems they wish to address are diverse. Yet, they appear to have very much in common, to have much in common. In trying to figure out what we are dealing here with, I'd like to explore with you this commonality by looking at some specifics and allowing for some informed by limited comparisons. There already exists a, a large literature, considerable theoretical literature, concerning the new social movements, a, a family of movements that have emerged in the West since 1960s and which are different from traditional, although also modern, so-called social movements, such as labor movements, um, which appeared in the early 20th century and even, and even before. That is, group actions that manifested themselves at the turn of the century and became uh, possible through urbanization, industrialization, education, and the mobility of, um, of labor. Uh, but I will not be talking here about the, these modern but traditional social movements like labor uh, movement that focus on specific social issues such as material conditions of a specific social class. 
uh, industry workers. Nor will I talk here about the so-called new social movements that were dominant in the second part of the 20th century for which economic issues uh, were of lesser concern. I mean here the feminist movement, civil rights movement, environmental movement, free software movement, uh, gay rights movement, peace movements, anti-nuclear movement, uh, anti-globalization movement. I think we can come up with a lot of them. Uh, they're often concerned with the questions of identity. Uh, these are organized around issues that transcend uh, 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 those framed by the belonging, by the class belonging, by the national belonging. What I like to focus here with you today are new, new social movements. We are, we are going, uh, uh, there is, it does, doesn't have yet a name, and that's what I'm proposing, new, new social movements. Um, um, though actually, I think they are not as recent as the events in, uh, uh, of the Arab Spring or Occupy Wall Street. I believe that we, uh, I, an academic, uh, but also very many social and political commentators, did not notice the freshness um, and distinctiveness of <laughs> earlier events, those that, that precede um, uh, uh, Arab Spring, such as emergence of Poland Solidarity Movement in 1980s. I'm here to talk about it because it was my experience. And, and, and perhaps it is because of that that I can see certain things that otherwise are not easily seen. Uh, Poland Solidarity Movement in 1980s um, um, emerged in August 1980 and led to dismantling of the communists in the region. It took eight years, indeed, and there were some um, uh, dramatic uh, uh, problems in the meantime, like introduction of martial law, but it was um, in the spring of 89 where Poles first time went and voted in the free, almost free, elections. A few months later, in November, the Berlin Wall came down everywhere, and, uh, and thus the communist uh, and the Cold War with it ended. I'd like to suggest that uh, what I call, for the sake of this presentation, the greening of uh, democracy has a particular trajectory, and that it has a common denominator, uh, which is people's longing for uh, human and civil rights. Not a specific issue. Not one uh, goal-oriented uh, thing that this or the other movement is about. The longing for human and civil rights. And I must emphasize that I see it as a phenomenon arising from a strong sense of indeed, of indeed being born free in, uh, and equal in dignity and rights, and of acting towards one another in the spirit of brotherhood. Now, those are quotations, as you, ga uh, as you gather, probably, from the uh, uh, captured in the first article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Born free and equal in dignity and rights, and acting towards one another in the spirit of brotherhood. Indeed, the rights revolution that erupted in the last 25 years, um, their sweeping wave gradually reaching many parts of the globe, are greening. They have taken place in autocratic states, usually sparked by the popular outrage, something that had happened there, over acts of heinous repression by states whose uh, leaders are often uh, called monarchs for life. Uh, so the idea that every person possesses inalienable rights, of its, uh, 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 that, that idea is of course universal. And, um, and, and that idea is not so easy those days to, uh, to, to, to be uh, kept in secret um, under the most rep even under the most repressive regime. People, everybody know it. They, people know that they have right to have rights. Uh, but um, the, new, the new, new social movements or the rights revolution have been challenging rightlessness through the ways they themselves develop locally. So whereas the idea is universal, that the way in its, in its rightlessness is being challenged is local. And that is one of the important features of those new, new social movements. What is similar though, so there are differences, but they're similar though, is that they all pursue alternative to their desperate situation by uh, nonviolent means. Uh, 
And by doing so, they depart from the classic understanding of revolution, which was to um, get rid of the power using force or using violence, cleansing the plate or a slate with the blood, and having a, ra a, a fresh start without worrying about uh, the crimes of the future. Uh, indeed, one could have seen uh, uh, the imaginative nonviolent strategy employed by an engaged public in the events that uh, led to the dismantling of the communism in Eastern Europe, apartheid in South Africa, and more recently, the various colored revolutions. I don't know whether you were able to keep up with those colored revolutions, but there was the Orange Revolution in Ukraine in 2004, and there was a Revolution of the Roses in Georgia in 2005, and there was a Tulips Revolution in Kyrgyzstan, and you know about the Green Revolution in Iran, and of course, um, Western, really Western journalists call the events in Tunisia uh, the uh, Jasmine Revolution. But I also think that, uh, that the part that, that, that Occupy Wall Street, and whatever we see happening around the city, and we, will, we are going to see more and more of it um, uh, in the coming weeks, is somewhat uh, related to that, to that wave of the, of the, uh, the greening of democracy. Um, and it is, um, as it was, inspired very much by the events that took place this summer in, um, in uh, Spain and last spring. In, uh, uh, in, in Arab countries. The Velvet Revolution, now that's something that you heard about. The name given to the developments in Czechoslovakia in late 1989. The Velvet Revolution perhaps the best conveys um, the, this peaceful intent of the revolution. The Velvet Revolution is not going to be violent, the Velvet Revolution is not going to be blood, it's not going to be Marxist revolution, but we all have to go, go. a lot of that, us will, will die, but we will remove, uh, for whatever it means, uh, violent means, uh, the powers that oppressed us, and we'll start again, and we'll, we will be the better ones. The Velvet Revolution um, uh, is, was a non-violent one, and, and those, the names of those various colored revolutions um, and that I mentioned capture I think not only nonviolence, but also something as a kind of esprit de corps. Uh, there is this sense, um, uh, uh, something which I think was unknown, or uh, uh, I think unknown in those pre pre prior revolutions. Uh, anyway, not in such a scale. Um, a, a sense of exhilaration, a joy, um, and, and, and happiness. And I will talk about it at the mo uh, in, a, in a moment because this, I, I am a person who is known for <laughs> I'm a sucker for hope. So I'm looking for those things because it seemed to me that not only our humanity but our lives depend to what extent we use force and to what, what extent we are imaginative if you, with using other things which are alternative to force. The recent and uh, quite controversial, and I don't know whether you had a chance to take a look at it, Human Rights World Report um, on the Arab Spring. Uh, I, I think it, announced, it was announced maybe, I don't know, three weeks ago or so, published three weeks ago. Had, an ve had a very urgent title directed, uh, obviously, to the international community. Human Rights Watch is an international NGO, large, or transnational, if you, can, if, if you want. And the title was Time to Abandon Autocrats and Embrace Rights. Human Rights Watch director, Ken, uh, or Kenneth uh, Roth, writes uh, in the introduction to that document. In finding its collective voice and power, the region's people transformed its politics in a way that it will not be easy to turn back. Let's think about these collective voices and power, as in my opinion, this is what's at the core of the rights revolutions and the greening of uh, democracy along with that. The greening of democracy we are talking here, uh, uh, here uh, uh, about is of, of course only a promise, uh, but a truly heartening one. As I have already mentioned, this particular dimension of political life has occurred in recent deca decades, both in non-democratic and democratic context. Poland was clearly non-democratic, so was South, South Africa. Um, and, uh, and it's closely related to the, to, the, to the politics of hope, or the, to what I call the politics of hope. In, in, in my book that Sandra had mentioned before, kindly, on Poland and South Africa, uh, uh, 
I call this dimension performative democracy. And you will hear a lot that phrase here today, but once you leave this room, I, I hope some, it, 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 it might prove to be useful. At least I hope that it will prove to be useful. Um, performative democracy is a dimension of democracy that uh, comes into being in non-democratic systems, in, in the system that there are no democratic institutions and no democratic procedures yet. Clearly not democratically elected government. But there is something there that is an initial, initial phase that prepares democracy, perhaps prepares democracy to come. Um, but it also, performative democracy can also be exercised and practiced in old democracies. In old democracies which has the established democratic instruments and procedures, but those democratic instruments and procedures lost <laughs> the insight of, uh, uh, of the citizens and in fact gain life on their own. Um, I believe that the very concept and practices of performative democracy um, have illuminated the rationale um, and the forms of the new social movements, of the new new social movements, which are founded, uh, which are founded on the realization by the large part of the people of their being denied rights, of being rightless. In trying to make sense of, this, uh, of the extraordinary geographic expansion of what I see as the initial stages of performative democracy, I thought of the image conveyed by the phrase, by, uh, by the um, greening of America, uh, the title of Charles Reich's, you may know, I read it in Polish, I was a very young person when I read this book, and it made a huge impression on me, um, um, Greening of America, which grew out of, the, of his 1970 piece for the New Yorker. I looked at it again recently, and this is what he says. There is a revolution underway, not like revolutions of the past. This is the revolution of the new generation. It has originated with the individual and with culture, and if it succeeds, it will change the political structure only as its final act. It will not require violence to succeed, and it, it cannot be successfully resisted by violence. It is now spreading rapidly, and already our laws, institutions, and social structures are changing in consequence. Now, Reich was, of course, writing about America, and, and the for many, his uh, observations might appear strikingly applicable to those uh, uh, who sat on the Tahrir Square, for example, or in front of the Gdańsk shipyard. Um, but I want to make a rather important assertion. What, what, what I call the performative democracy, the dimension of democracy, that is performative democracy, and what others think of um, as uh, rights revolutions, is indeed a new, new social movement that seems to be expanding across continents, but in each case, it is indigenously conceived, uh, inspired by locals, inspired, in, indigenously inspired and acting of democracy by local citizens. In each case, it is instigated by a local catalytic uh, element, uh, event. The Polish Solidarity Movement was incited in 1980 by the firing of this woman, 50-year-old crane operator, a super quota worker named Anna Valentinovich, highly res respected for her uh, relentless work ethics, who had helped to put up the cross, and that's why she was fired, commemorating that commemorated workers killed, 173 workers killed, by the police in 1970, while on their way to the morning shift at the Gdańsk shipyard. So 10 years later, in 1980, this woman and some other people decided to put the cross where the, where the uh, shooting took place, because the government, 10 years before, promised that there would be a monument. There was no monument, they put the cross. She was fired as one of the organizers. Catalytic man. People went. Uh, to strike, 20,000 workers in Gdańsk shipyard went to strike, entire Poland joined in. Has to, something had to happen, that, that was the trigger. In Ukraine, 
It was the election fraud in late 2004 and the related poisoning of Viktor Yushchenko. You remember that face. Whose disfigured face became the face of the Orange Revolution. In Tunisia, it was triggered by a desperate act of self-immolation by the 26-year-old uh, Mohamed Bouazi, educated but jobless, street vegetable seller, who supported his uh, family of uh, his three children, but in fact the uh, extended family of eight. He not only saw his unlicensed vegetable cart and his food confiscated, but he was subjected to a situation of um, unbearable humiliation by a policewoman. In Egypt, it was the disfigured face of 28-year-old Khaled Said after he was arrested in June 2010 in a cyber cafe in Alexandria and beaten to death by the police. The image of his mangled face, and I didn't want to show you the image I had because it's absolutely unbearable to look at it. This image uh, of his face went viral on the internet a few months later, and it is this face that launched the revolution in Egypt. In Syria, it was fueled on March 15, 2011, by the arrest and torture of children aged 18 to 15 who had been caught writing freedom graffiti on the wall of their schoolhouse in the southern city of Dara. One of the kids was killed, was murdered. You can read it, topple the treacherous Assad, it says on that. In Libya, it was the arrest on February 12, uh, 2011, of Fatih Terbil, a human rights activist and a lawyer of 1,000 victims killed by the Libyan security forces in the 1996 Abu Salim prison massacre, mostly political, uh, political prisoners. So this is how the Arab Spring came into being. And though the dictators might be gone, of course democracy is not there yet. Autocracies cannot be easily transformed into democracies, as democracies, a democracy is neither an easy nor a quick fit, and the building of a robustly democratic poli polity takes time. And no doubt there will be setbacks. Uh, in the case of Poland, there was martial law. Solidarity was outlawed for eight years. Um, and only then, in 1989, in the spring of 1989, that delegalized solidarity was able to negotiate with the regime the first democratic elections in the spring of 89. So beginnings are important. I wanted to say that despite of that, beginnings are important. And it is truly important that they, are, that they be indeed as intended as nonviolent grounded in local knowledge, expressive of a homegrown grown imagination, and performed by local actors. Taking down the Saddam Hussein in 2000 monument, in 2003, with the help of the United States Army engineers and American armored vehicles, did not yield the expected results. As, as the act was neither imagined nor initiated nor owned by the local people. But what happened in Tunisia, Egypt, or Libya was local. And it took quite a bit of time for the Western powers to realize that the carefully con uh, calculated policy of containment had to be rethought. And though the Arab Spring did not bring about overnight democracy, and you read the papers and you see that there is going to be, this is uh, going to be an extended process. It is, in my opinion, extremely important to appreciate its democratic potential and the invaluable experience that will help to furnish democracy with a local hue. How many of us, including the tourists to Egypt pyramids, were really aware that Egypt had been under the continuous state of emergency for 30, 31 years until last spring. That the rights and freedoms of its citizens guaranteed in the Constitution 
were indefinitely suspended. This is what the state of emergency is, the, the constitution is suspended, including the freedom of association, freedom of movement, and freedom of expression. Uh, except for family gatherings, it was illegal for more than four people to gather even in private homes. How many of us knew that censorship was legalized? No freedom of the press, in other words. And that the tens of thousands had been detained without trial for defying those limitations. That people lived in fear of the ubiquitous security forces. And that number of political prisoners in the country of 77 million ran over 30,000 at any point. When I spoke recently with a, a young journalist, became a friend um, uh, from Egypt, Nora Yunus, a journalist and filmmaker, um, and the editor of the major internet-based daily, the Egypt Independent, Al-Masri al yom she clearly thought that this was just the beginning of the process of democratization. And I, you know, I kept asking her various questions. And she, and she said, I said, so you don't worry about it? You know, you had these elections to the parliament and Muslim Brotherhood is in it. And uh, they actually have even 50% of it. And the presidential elections are coming um, in May on May 22nd. And all those shadowy <laughs> figures um, uh, from the Mubarak time are trying to get in on one hand and the Islamists on the other hand. And she said, look, 40% uh, Egyptians will be then, in May <laughs> 22, when they will go to vote, 40 years old. And for them, the most important um, uh, 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 experience, formative experience, and the point of reference is not the coup d'etat uh, military coup of 1952. Now, some of you may know, I had to go and educate myself. This, is, uh, this was the time when the, uh, when, when, uh, when the monarchy was uh, 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 ended and uh, when the republic was established um, with the help of the young uh, officers, right? Military coup, which changed the, uh, the, the, the system uh, uh, as it was at the time. And for very many Egyptians, this was a formative, uh, important element and the point of reference. She said, those, those people do not have anything to do with, with that. What they have to do with it, for them, they, they reference it as uh, the Square. Their most formative experience at the point of, 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 uh, uh, of reference is the revolution of January 25th, 2011. We tweet, she said. And we follow the tweets of those whom we met during the revolution on the squares and streets of, 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 of Egypt. Um, we trusted them because we met them. Um, this is our debate. It makes us stronger. We do not feel alone. Nobody can alienate us, and alienate us anymore. And yes, there are some problems. Uh, there are limits, there are still limits to communication because, of course, army is now temporarily in charge of the situation in Egypt. So when I write an article, I cannot use the word army until I clear it up with the, with the Office of Censorship, even if I'm only writing about the army sports team. So she said, yes, there are limitations, but we do know that at some point they will have to, uh, they, they, that they have to give the power um, um, uh, uh, up and, and that it's not going to be forever. Uh, but just to make the whole thing less abstract, and I promise it's get, it will turn less abstract in a short while. When I talk about what I call performative democracy, which is this difficult to capture dimension of democracy because it's difficult to institutionalize. Um, um, I have in, in mind a, a, a dimension of democratic practice that, that emerged first when in Spain in 1970, when Franco died, the society negotiated the peaceful departure from the, from the dictatorship, from the fascism. Without, army was in charge, people have weapons, uh, it was a bloody regime, and yet it was possible at the round table to have representatives of all parties or groupings or institutions and or organizations uh, with the extraordinary, with the help of the king, one would think that this is a, a very conservative and traditional institution of the monarch, monarch uh, and with the authority of the Catholic Church, they were able actually to, to, to manage the establishment launching of democracy. The same happened in Poland in the 80s and in South Africa in 1990s. 
Those three then autocratic or authoritarian regimes were very different from each other, Spanish, Polish, and South African, as, as, as they had the different histories and uh, the different strategies in which um, those regimes were resisted by the, by the citizenry. But what they had in common was that the, their citizens challenged and peacefully changed oppressive regimes, disassembled the immensely concentrated power structure, and launched the process of democratization. And I believe that this phenomenon ought to assume its legitimate place in our thinking about democracy today, um, as it may illuminate developments that are taking place in front of our eyes. So let's take a look at those recent revolutions up close and discuss some of their features as, as they share, um, um, that they share with performative democracy and see whether there are indeed reasons for hope. Uh, first, already commented on, uh, the first feature is this broadly uh, right-based objective. This is what they are about. And then there is this particular publicness facilitated by emblematic spaces furnished uh, by diverse actors and, and very polyphonic, again, diverse voices. My, my guide to the politics of hope was Hannah Arendt. Hannah Arendt was teaching at the New School for Social Research. I have never, ever met her. I came once she was, she was not around anymore. Um, a, and I feel a particular affinity because she was an exiled scholar um, who arrived from my corner of the world and who ended up teaching at the New School. And this is where our stories overlap. And in that way, she somewhat helped me, a person who never experienced democracy. I came from the autocratic authoritarian regime here in a short period uh, of freedom uh, when solidarity was alive. The 16 months between um, August 1980 and uh, December 1981, uh, in December, martial law was imposed, state of emergency was imposed, but, but the, the 16 months people traveled and I traveled and I took this opportunity, I wanted to learn English, I wanted to become a better sociologist, I was young and, and, and I had ambitions and I thought we have a great future in front of us. So, so I didn't have an experience of with democracy, zero one could say. Um, but, I, but she helped me, um, a, to think about what, what are the necessary conditions for democracy to emerge and to thrive. And for her, it was a public space, public place, a place that people have to need in order to meet and to discuss things that they have in common, a place for debate, a place for dialogue, a public place, not a private place, not at home. Home is important, but only when it Conversation, uh, conversation gets out of, the, out of the household, outside of the kitchen table, then it gains this uh, political importance. A place where people can see each other, where they can be seen, and where they can discuss things they have in common, where they can say things and those things can be heard by others. There is no democracy with, with, without the public sphere. This is where people discover a taste for democracy and, and their own performative capacities, and I will talk about it in a moment. This is where the anonymous uh, and often impersonal and institutional way of speaking is replaced by concrete individual and distinctive voices. Such voices or speech acts are the key elements of performative democracy, are the op because they are opposite to violence, which Hannah Arendt, uh, according to her, she says violence is to act without argument and without reckoning with consequences. So not so many people realized that it was really the gradual, gradual, persistent, and inventive work of citizens that opened up the public space in Poland. And not very many people see that this is really the beginning of the different way in which others conceived how they can become actors in their own uh, backyards, in their own, in their own places. And I think that the foundation for hope and democracy-oriented performative strategy at least for a social uh, East and Central Europe, had been uh, laid out in 1970s in three essays by three um, authors from the region. Hope and Hopelessness was an essay written by Leszek Kołakowski, a professor who was kicked out of Poland and taught at Oxford. A New Evolutionism was written by a young unemployed historian from Warsaw, Adam Michnik. And Power of the Powerless, the third essay, uh, by a playwright from Prague, whose plays were not 
allowed to be, were, were not allowed to be produced there. That's what happened. Now, their program for change uh, abandoned the path of revolution that has been cherished by progressive thinkers for more than a century, that kind of universal path, which was still a, attractive for many people, particularly the, the, the Western left, in many corners of the world, because it promised the swift fundamental change. Uh, but the, the insight of, of those three essays, or performativists, as I call them, uh, were all well grounded, not in the universal idea of revolution, but in domestic canon of the local cultures, the domestic ca ca canon of, uh, of cultural references informed by local conditions, by local economies, by local histories, and by political experiences. Um, this part of the world was too much, went through too many wars and, and horrible things to think again that if we use force, we would be better off. After all, communism actually promised justice for all, better lives, a much brighter future, and respect for all. And this is where the three performativists came. They said, we do have this promise. Let's expose it. That's what uh, uh, Havel's Power of Powerless is about. Um, let's expose the contradictions that, uh, on, of that system on the level of language, with its broken contracts, with its broken promises, uh, hidden discourses, over discourses. Um, and uh, in fact, those three dissident authors show how, how those contradictions could be exploited without recourse to violence. I'm talking about it because I wanted to say that there is no performative democracy without capacity to speak freely. And language is very important in that. Not tanks and not weapons, but language, but words. Um, I experienced both and studied, of course, the kind of cautious emergence of incre increasing dissent and its performative strategies in Poland. And, um, and I think that in the countries uh, which, um, uh, in the societies which live under dictatorship, and this is the case of Arab Spring, the conditions for performativity first occur when the long, unused word, almost forgotten word, uh, comes out of, from hiding, squeezing itself through the cracks into the open. And when, that first uh, when, when it's first heard, it instigates the emergence of an undeniably public realm. For Arendt, the condition for this constitution of public sphere is a space of appearance. You have to have a place to show, to appear, and to see others. That is any public setting where people can come together and interact through speech. Havel, in his Power of the Powerless, wrote, every society, of course, requires some degree of social organization. Yet, if that organization is to serve people and not the other way around, then people have to be liberated and space created so that they can organize themselves in a meaningful ways. Such a space was furnished for the early solidarity gatherings by factories, universities, churches, even state enterprises during this 16 months of freedom. And perhaps it is most emblematic uh, site was in front of the Gdańsk shipyard. Let's take a look at the most talked about site of the Arab Spring, Tahrir Square. As you probably know by now, the Arabic Tahrir means liberation, liberation square. And it is a major square indeed in downtown Cairo. In fact, it's not exactly a square as you can see, as its center is a busy traffic circle, huge and grassy, that was later occupied by the tent city. It shaped further blurred, uh, last spring anyway, by construction work. Um, the, the, the square spills over into two limbs, one ending at the Egyptian Museum, and the other one, and the other one uh, uh, leading to a bridge over the Nile, uh, Al Tahrir Avenue, where when an army checkpoint is installed. It is an enormous place with several large streets feeding into it, like a huge octopus or a star, if you prefer, <laughs> maybe better. Mo most of us first got to know Tahrir Square on uh, January 25, 2011, when the first large demonstration against the Mubarak uh, regime gathered there with 50,000 people, and the square became the emblematic heart of the Egyptian revolution. 
five, uh, five days later, and I was then in uh, South Africa, and I watched Al Jazeera, English Al Jazeera said there was one million people already on the square. Five days later. Um, peacefully assembled on the square and on the adjacent streets. Press coverage mentioned the extraordinary solidarity of people sitting around bonfi bonfires and talking. What was most extraordinary seemed as though the entire society was represented there. Most significantly, um, the very numerous, approximately 40%, participation of women. It was also a very young crowd, many young couples with children. There were several stages or platforms uh, uh, around, this, around this square, sponsored by different groups, where different competitive ideas and programs were presented, where various performances appeared, where musicians played, singers sang, groups <coughs> chanted. In a society like Egypt, living for decades under the oppressive law of state of emergency, the very fact that people, the uh, fact of people sitting next to each other on the grass, men and women, Muslim, Copts, and secular Egyptians, was a miracle in its own right. And a revolution, uh, as not just physical distances has uh, 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 become minimized, but also uh, it was a revelation that it was not just physical distances were minimized, but also social and cultural uh, distances were lessened. Many have described it as a liberating and exhilarating experience. You can see, of course, one the, the, the book is a Koran on the side, and uh, of course it's a Coptic cross. Um, liberating and exhilarating experience that brought tears to the eyes and created a situation of remarkable euphoria. Yes, there was violence, initially on the part of the police and the military, later on the part of those who were called thugs. Nobody knows with whom they were really uh, associated or affiliated. And there was an orchestrated attempt to infiltrate the crowds, to provoke them, to divide them. But people quickly learned how to recognize the plainclothes security forces and warned each other. But above all, but above all people saw each other. As Tahrir facilitated encounters and conversations that otherwise would not have happened, not in public. With all this, the world indeed felt upside down, as in a time of a carnival, when the impossible is possible, when a jester can be, be a king, in a carnavalesque reversal of roles, when fear gives way to joy, with painted faces, roses given to the police, nuns cheering the pedestrians, dances on the normally inhuman and polluted square, and an enthusiasm for new possibilities. Uh, perhaps the most interesting observation, observations point out to the diversity, variety, polyphony of voices, the presence of individuality, peculiar crowds but not masses, indeed swarms of autonomous individuals, the constitution of an autonomous, autonomous public, something so characteristic of, the, uh, of, 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 of these new kinds of new movements and the happiness, public happiness. When later on people want the right to have a referendum, expressed through social media, mostly through tweets. Here is one tweet. Eight o'clock in the morning, the line was endless. Now that's the line to the voting booth. My body shivers with happiness. In that way, Tahrir Square has become both sight and narrative of a societal hope that centers on the kind of change activated by a newly arisen public realm. Such a realm creates the conditions for dialogue, engaged conversation, negotiation, and compromise that are deeply invested in the democratic promise. So performative democracy, this dimension of our political life that prepares the early stages of the democratic project, is not easy to theorize. And that is why it has only recently come to attention of political sociologists, political scientists, and political philosophers. Yet one could observe instances of it in concrete situations and processes having to do with the forms and genres of speech. We all recognize the importance of speech in the constitution of democracy and the prerequisite, prerequisite of freedom of speech in the functioning of democracy. Performativity focuses on situation in which words act. I know it's difficult to imagine, but just they act, and they, they change reality. The best example, of it, the easiest example of it, of performativity, is when you 
Uh, when you get married and you go to the church or you go to the city hall or to go to the synagogue and whoever is celebrating or yes, priest uh, or, or the officer says, and now your husband and wife. Nothing had happened. It was just the sentence. Those are the most performative words you can think about. Uh, words and speech and language have a, a incredibly untapped potential. One can also say, and I'm not going to go to, into it because it's a separate issue that also words can kill. And we do know uh, everything here about uh, all of us, about hate speech, and I'm not going to go, go to it because I'm trying to focus on the potential in building and, and of this kind of constructive thing which is related with the promise of democracy based on people speaking together. As Sandra in her book just said, democracy is discussion, yes. We have to discuss something in order to have it. Kowakowski, uh, so, so of course, that kind of performativity that I'm talking about, that kind of acts of speech or voices um, uh, are perfect. But the key element of performative democracy are, are the opposite of violence. Kowakowski, Michnik, and Havel, the three architects that I mentioned of the dismantling of communism, did ask people not to expect miracles, fast fixes help from outside, or any automatic self-correction of the authoritarian system. Instead, they made a case for a small, gradual, incremental changes. Um, this could be advanced, they argued, in two ways. By revealing, if possible to the larger public, the contradictions, ambiguities, ineptness, and absurdities within the system itself. And by bringing into play the human rights instruments, provided by the international agreements um, that had already been signed in the mid-70s in Helsinki, so-called Helsinki Accords, um, by most of the common states. So they signed the, the Helsinki Agreement, the Human Rights Agreements, but they didn't do anything about it. Uh, human Rights Agreement in Helsinki were signed in 75. In 76, Havel and his friends decided to ask the Czech government politely by writing a letter uh, what is happening? You did sign it, we were to go, be able to travel, we were to have passports. What had happened with those promises? Uh, eventually when uh, the letter was, uh, was written and 1,000 signatures was, was collected under it, it became known as the Charter 77. It was already 1977. Charter 77 is to ask you know, what had happened to the agreements that the government signed. So that's the strategy, those are the strategies. Uh, when living in tr truth is repressed, as Havel might have put it, performativity is repressed. So a careful reading of those three thinkers reveals that the instruments for change are, are anchored in public speech acts, whether they turned out to be theater performance, an uh, open letter by a group of citizens like Charter 77, a poem circulated um, uh, outside of the state censorship, or, or the demands written in cardboard and displayed by the striking workers at the gate of the Gdańsk shipyard. Speech and action are not only attributes of freedom, as Aaron says, but a key source of individual dignity and societal hope, as they contribute to the sense of a, of a polity in which people and their different voices matter in both making and maintaining it. Indeed, there is nothing new in the observation that we are often imprisoned by language. Language is a conventional system of signs, and if we want to communicate, we have to rely on its conventional usage. But, uh, but there are dimensions of language and usages of language that, when tweaked a bit, have the capacity either to keep us captive or to bring uh, in some fresh air, helping us breathe that we are captive of language confined within the, uh, a language that does not serve us anymore is conveyed vividly by Susan George when she says that cost recovery is the polite way of saying make families pay to educate their children. Indeed, we hear it all the time, education is a very good investment. On the other hand, a pleasantly surprising example of a more refreshing linguistic game comes from Occupy Wall Street. Yes, we camp. Let's go to the Tahrir Square and focus for a, while, for a while on the 
newly awakened citizen actors and their voices. From bits of interviews, we know that the object of the discussion was initially above all Mubarak and the regime he embodied. Um, but, uh, but we also heard them talking about real elections and about new constitutions, and that they prayed for justice for all. And uh, that was the beginning, the beginning of a larger conversation, of a dialogue that, that they somewhat badly needed. We heard that this is how people felt they regained their dignity, expressing uh, on their own, yes, we can. We heard the freedom chants, horia, horia, and about courteous words uttered towards each other, even in the most trying circumstances. With the passage of time and with the considerable frustration caused by what often looked like hurdles made by the regime, by the pro Buramarak families, by those who were legitimately afraid and tired, by elites hanging on to their power, we also heard about the massive calls on Twitter and on, on the square for peace on Tahrir. So with, with, with its eye on publicness, on dialogue, on compromise, performative democracy, it's not a realm in which insular groups that exploit fear can feel comfortable, or generally those advocating, uh, advocating illiberal arrangements. Despite its inherent drama, performative democracy can actually be a joyous and affirmative uh, dimensions of the political, yet one that self-limits its passions by necessarily framing them into agreed upon forms, genres, and conventions. We saw the remarkable restraint expressed in their posters and signs. Freedom equals equality, said once. One. And once Mubarak finally stepped down on the 18th day of, revolution, of the revolution and had passed all authority to the Council of the Armed Forces, Tahrir erupted with the now famous lift your head up high, you are Egyptian. And also, everyone who loves Egypt, come and rebuild Egypt. <coughs> Many talked about a woman who initiated a memorable chant taken up by thousands. Christians, Muslims, we are all one. Jasmine Rashidi, by now a famous blogger and writer, reported on a pop group giving a concert at Tahrir Square, singing, it's the beginning, the beginning of our life, the beginning of stability, the beginning of security, the beginning of your life. Say yes, yes, yes. And groups of youth chanting, no one throws garbage on the ground. And girls, this revolution is yours too. In a difficult economic uh, situation, further worsened by tourism, brought to almost complete halt, Numerous signs were aimed at the uh, many foreign broadcasters. Please, please visit the new Egypt. <laughs> Land of peace. And Egypt is safe. So what we see here really is the self-discovered discovered autonomous speaking eye, a citizen actors of the movement who were trying to force the state to engage in, a, in dialogue with them. And people learned quickly. What was extraordinary about it was that it was a self-organized but leaderless movement, a perfect example of the emergence of a truly autonomous public, autonomous and independent from any center of power, but open to persuasion and eager to learn how to negotiate its different positions. This is an exhilarating civic exercise of direct democracy performed in K Cairo, Tahrir, but also in Manhattan's Tukoti Park. But performative democracy, like carnival, does not last. It's temporary, it's a temporary phenomenon. Carnival reveals potential power while the prevailing power is suspended. And even though it evolves in real time, not in an a priori carnival restricted time frame of an annual ritual, it necessarily, follow, necessarily followed by a time of Lent, carnival does not last. In its most glorious instances, it constitutes a site of both joyous and subversive experience in the carnivalesque public square where fear and suffering are degraded. With Mubarak gone, Tahrir has changed as well. The next day, women and men of Cairo came to clean up the square, removing both litter and graffiti. The barbed wire was gone, and the swarm faded. 
However, the leaderlessness of the swarm presented uh, its problematic side. There was nobody to talk to the international community, nobody with full moral authority, nobody with full trust of the others, and at the same time, a competent coordinator of ideas on how to proceed, what are the next steps, how to move forward. More seasoned activists expressed unease about the unfinished revolution, an anxiety about what might now emerge as the more powerful and only actor is gone. At one of the meetings about way forward, reported by El Rashidi, people could not agree about how to proceed, proceed on anything. But there was no disagreement about the need to re return to Tahrir. The people need to return to Tahrir. Our strength is there, said one of the activists. Indeed, the public needs a, sp a space from which it can speak and in which it can be seen, where people can directly communicate with each other and feel the temperature of the events. Here is the public emerging in front of the gates of the shipyard I talked about, occupied by two weeks by 20,000 workers. We are with you, it says. And of course, you can see there national flags, holy figures, flowers, flowers. And this is the pulse of the Orange Revolution in Kiev, the capital city of Ukraine, the biggest, squ biggest square called Maidan, that is Independence Square. A tenth city in December, um, in December 2004 facilitated the victory of the Orange Revolution. And here is Tsukoti Park, the heart of Occupy Wall Street movement. You understand this means I'm with you, right? This is how they vote in Tsukoti Park. Not by that, but just people say that. And that I don't agree. I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there is a whole uh, thing of gestures that people are voting here. Um, in fact, to co of course, that movement is spread all over the place. Um, to conclude, the key features of performative democracy are that it is locally conceived, that it's funded on speech-based means, and thus provides alternative to violent solutions and to despair. It's accompanied by the realization than even be, being a part of a larger collectivity or swarm, one can act on, it, on one's own without any powerful facilitator, and that even while speaking publicly, one is still in charge of one's own speech. And I believe now that the reappropriation of language by the people, the free exercise of the new non-mandatory fresh speech, was at the very heart of what was happening in Gdańsk, in Tunisia, and in Egypt. Performative democracy, as enacted and practiced on public squares, but also in myriads of community meetings, discussions, conversations, or performances, <laughs> performative democracy presents, represents, a kind of political engagement critical for any democracy in which the key identity of its actors is that of citizens, and in which the good of the society of la at large, and not that of a narrow interest group, is at stake. Though it's not just another name for direct democracy, performative democracy does indeed reduce the distance between people and brings them closer together, thriving as it does in the rich practice of face-to-face -face meetings and ceaseless discussions. These launch a process of learning, forming opinions, reasoning, and appreciating the value of compromise. And this is indeed transformative for those who take part. Uh, this is one of the underappreciated features of uh, Occupy Wall Street phenomenon, another leaderless, self-organized movement that brings out the richer texture of liberal democracy and makes it easier to see the prospects for democratic actions in times of crises, reviving the spirit of a democratic polity when the system has become weakened by complacency. Occupy Wall Street is not a movement we know from any other moment in history with its horizontal structure that makes top-down commands unworkable. One month, uh, month after it emerged, I wrote that the movement is being accused of being unclear, directionless, fragmented, vague, and fuzzy. Indeed, it is not made up of disciplined cadres marching with mass-produced banners. It does not have a central committee, and though it is an expression of what one Sukoti Park woman veteran 
called an economic civil rights movement, it stays away from specific demands. These are the two, but still not easy to uh, list or prioritize. It is not just about jobs, it's not just about mounting poverty or student debts that now total more than all our credit card debts. It's not only about the corruptibility of the political system, and it's not only about the accountability of the banks and bankers. It's not. It is not unlike other rights revolution, some, about something much more fundamental. And I think it has something to do with the way we are locked into rigid ways of thinking and talking about democracy, disregarding its performative potential. Uh, Occupy Wall Street, with its emphasis on consensual decision making, has raised many hopes and expectations. I see it as a movement to recover the meaning of democracy by searching beyond the models that delineate the procedural mechanics of it, which often collapse into a minimalist version of democracy. Uh, as an inst instrument, instrumental uh, institutional arrangement for competing interest groups with the eye on the people's votes. Uh, the return to consensus is the return, at least in part, in part, to the original meaning of the word consensus. Consensus is feeling with. Even participatory democracy does not seem to grasp it for me anymore. In the case of Poland or Egypt, performative democracy prepares the ground for a democratic order to emerge when there was none before. However, performative democracy not only explore, explores the possibilities for a peaceful launching of democracy, but also, as in the case of o Occupy Wall Street, for re-infusing a jaded democracy with heightened sense of public life. The word of caution. The instances of performative democracy I have discussed here are the perfect reverse of the kind of oxymoronic democracy that one has seen in Iraq. For example, imported or imposed from the outside, along with the key benchmark free and fair elections that could legitimately bring to power non-democratic regimes. These instances, if reflected upon, should serve as a cautionary reminder for democratic missionaries who think that they know better, but also for the citizens of any democracy who think that they take, that who, uh, any democracy that has become taken for granted and relies increasingly on experts, electoral campaign, managers, bureaucrats, and money. The greening of performative democracy can only happen when local people bring their own experience, life experience, and imagination to the system. And a final remark. Ah, uh, the prior image that you see, that you saw, and I went to it too fast, uh, was about um, a tremendous role uh, that uh, uh, played by the new media in the in the process, uh, whether in Tahrir Square or in Tsukoti Park, uh, that that Twitter's uh, even if somebody didn't have a Facebook page. Tweets could mobilize people immediately. The pictures are taken. It's very difficult to say that that didn't happen. Um, and, uh, tweets could be very interesting because they could be a news sent from one phone to another and then therefore forwarded to millions of phones. Clashes intensify on the Tahrir Square. There was one of them. But they could be also lyrical and emotional. And they could convey a state of mind. What was tolerated in pre-revolution uh, Egypt will not be tolerated in post-revolution uh, anymore. One of the most famous tweets. Um, and here, ooh, how can I do that? I wanted to show you that. Okay, okay I, will go, I will go through very quickly because I want you to see the last, the last slide. The last slide, hmm. It's probably a way of making it bigger, but it doesn't, meet, it doesn't really matter. I don't know whether you remember this TV image of a young woman beaten and disrobed by the soldiers on Tahrir Square um, in, late, in December 2011, so quite recently. The Abaya-clad woman was, uh, who quick, quickly became known as the girl in the blue bra. This, shop, uh, this shocking image, if you will see, there is a, there is a foot which will end up in a second on her chest. Um, um, the image of the assault went viral on the internet, along with the soldier's remark, 
one of the soldiers said, <coughs> she was just asking for it. And um, so it went, vi uh, it, it went viral on the internet and reignited the process against the abuses of power by now the military that was to guard the process of making of democracy. And of course, next day, thousands of women mobilized by tweets came to march through the street of Cairo, streets of Cairo. When I asked my uh, Egyptian uh, journalist friend, Nora, about the omnipresence of Twitter in Egypt, um, saying that, of course, I know that in America, people also tweet, you know, there are some people who tweet. Um, she answered, nobody has time to do anything else. We cannot write blogs. We cannot, we don't have time for anything. Tweeting is necessary in Egypt. We have too many pro other problems. We can, don't, the kinds of problems Americans have do not require tweets. And with this hopeful message, I want to thank you. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. You mentioned that the performative <coughs> uh, democracies are very short in time. Yeah. Hopefully, leaving yeah. to direct democracy. Have you ever found that there was a need to have an, a second performative democracy before the direct took place? I, I'm, I'm, I'm just. I what, was my my argument. Yes. Of I, I, not only I thought, but I think that there is something like that. It is just. I think it is the dynamization. Uh, this is the dimension which cannot be there forever. Nora said we don't have time, we have to do revolution. You cannot do that all the time. And also, it is often because other forces come. In this case, we are talking here about the, um, so, so in fact, the re-energizing of the dimension, um, making people uh, realize that actually they can say that they don't agree, and they have a right to say things. That makes a big impression, yes. So in other words, it's not as simple as that here is the, the performativity, and then you know, somewhere the democracy appears. Because very often, it is, as I said, uh, only as I am a Catholic, so you can uh, uh, see how I'm using the metaphors. It's a carnival and land, and carnival necessarily is followed by the time of land. That, that doesn't mean that it cannot be democracy. But even if things are kind of yeah, when we take first for granted that somebody else does it for us in a way, I consider that kind of a disappearance of the performativity. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead. How, how, how do you feel about how long can this square or this place thrive mm -hmm. and be I mean, I would hope, I would hope that people at some point will, using the capacity of being together in the square and being able to discuss, will come up with the, uh, with the forms uh, which, uh, and institutions that, not necess that, that will kind of emerge out of this experience, which does not have to um, be identical to what we have here or what Poles have there or what Tunisians even did. So in other words, I would hope that that, that discussion leads to, it's, it's being translated into, could be translated into something else. The problem with that is, that I mentioned at the very end, is that in the case of Egypt, although the horizontalism, I don't know whether you know this, this term, horizontalism, this is, this is that kind of a, um, a movement which avoids any, set, any leadership. Horizontalism was not necessarily the choice of people at Tahrir Square, but clearly there was no leaders. There was a sense at some point that maybe, I mean, there were some, pass, some, some, some possibilities, but those people didn't really decide, they decided to, to keep back. So there is a problem because you have various groups um, and then the only way in which democracy is being institutionalized is through the already known, well-tested and good uh, structures such as parliament and elections to the parliament. You know, there will be presidential elections. Whether the army is going, right now the army is, uh, is um, um, I I kind of guarding the process. Whether the army is going to be stepping out of the process as they initially uh, promised uh, in June after the elections in June 2012. Nobody is clear. Um, so I, I, I do think that 
the square, performativity of the square, it, it is to empower people with the sense that they can do things, but they have to go and do other things. Otherwise, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't believe in the utopia of the, but I think it's important. It's also important for others to see, yes, to, for powers to see that something has to be done. So, uh, so the uh, continuous stuff on the square, uh, when they said we have to go to, to the square, they had an amazing sense that this is where they are, that this is where the power comes from. And also this is where they are together and united. And um, so it may take, it may take time, but, but the Polish solidarity was very interesting in, in, in kind of developing new, completely unknown forms of, uh, of self-organization. And I think that, um, that, that, that in that interim uh, period, it is important before going really to the election. So, so, it's not, so, 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 so you would not face the situation in which, in fact, the elections were kind of taken over again or hijacked by the groups that didn't have much to do with the, with the, with the, with the sense of um, unity and uh, outrage uh, uh, against rightlessness on the square. I guess you would have to say it's necessary, it's necessary but not sufficient because eventually that's the, right. uh, yeah. laws have yeah. to be made, declarations yeah. that's have right. to be made. You, you have the Charter 77, you yeah. have the Declaration yes. of Independence in this country yes. after, the, after the, mm -hmm. the swarm. That's right. But even the swarm, I don't know whether you know this, I love that, I'm taking a voice, I love the idea of the swarm, I, I'm not sure whether it's the best idea I could come up with, but the thing is that those are not faceless movements anymore, you know, I mean that it's not, it's so refreshing that, you know, you see, you see even this picture, the first picture on the Tahrir Square, probably won't be able to show it, but it's interesting. Mm. I'm not sure, I'm so bad with this, this stuff. But there is a first picture which shows people sitting. Very interesting. This is it, but it's too small to show you. But what it is is people are sitting like that on the square. You see those little circles? That's how people sit. And in fact, this is quite extraordinary because it's, a, it's, it's, it's an expression of, you know, of separate personhood. You know, here I am, it's me, it's me. And I don't have to dissolve in the other, yeah. Excuse me. I was struck by your... I'm sorry. Uh, yes, you will be the next. I, I promise, yes. Mm -hmm. By your emphasis on these movements needing to come from the local. And there's yeah. been a lot of debate about the role of, of uh, Western powers, not so much in terms of violence force, but NGO is helping to promote the role of law and democracy in the Arab world for the last you know, 10 years and even more. Do you think that this has all been for naught? No, I think that friends are needed everywhere. <laughs> I am not against that. I think it's very, very important. I'm just, I, I, I would be, and I, and I do know that most of this um, uh, NGOs are very experienced in working transnationally. What I would be very, very nervous about is that they bring blueprints and say, do it this way. I don't think they, they, does, they do it this way, so to speak, but I would be, this is something that I'm very worried about. And I think that NGOs are much more flexible and, you know, they appear to be a bad way. And I, and I think that, that, that and, and there is a sense of understanding that it, you know, that you have, to, you have to invent yourself stuff, you know. There are certain stuff we can help you with. The problem that I have right now is that our government have written a check with no conditions to Muslim Brotherhood instead for one hundred and a half billion dollars instead of actually either putting conditions or giving it to civil society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. You mentioned that there was a continuous state of emergency for over three decades yeah. in Asia. I'm wondering to what extent did the United States contribute to that huh. because it was less important to the United States that there was a dictatorship than that Mubarak had recognized Israel and made a peace treaty with Israel. And therefore, the United States wanted him to remain in power. Yeah, that's a, a, this is a separate framework already. And it's, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, it is, we, we are so nervous. And there are good reasons for that, perhaps. Uh, that we don't want to deal with the regime that we may not understand because it might come from a culturally, it's not going to be secular, it will come from the religion or culture that is very alien to us, that we award or reward autocrats. And I think it's very, very problematic. I think that because we do it, those cultures actually uh, drift away from us and instead of, of, of kind of embracing them and seeing, you know, let's, let's look at each other and see, you know, how similar we are, in fact, and how in, in our in our respective differences we are, um, uh, we decide that it's easier to to, to work with uh, 
with those who look like us and speak like us, and and maybe they can uh, keep control and discipline those strange, unruly societies. Uh, I, I'm afraid that you touched something here, which is a very, very big point. Is that the whole international constellation is a is a problem with that when when we are talking about Arab Spring. I want to uh, thank uh, Elge Bieta for illuminating uh, some of the uh, present and uh, bringing, bringing, bring, bringing it to our attention to a very important phenomenon. With the, we have lots of questions, as you can see, and I think the whole world has lots of questions about where uh, this is all going, and it will be going in all very different ways at, in very different time frames. I think you said it took eight years for solidarity, which was the, the mother of all these movements in a sense in contemporary times, to evolve into a uh, democratic government. So we have to be a little bit patient. I, I don't want to keep you uh, much longer, but I do want to remind you of two things that are coming up in, in this season, and that is our bus trip to the uh, Hudson Valley. Anyone who uh, would like to uh, sign up for it and hasn't done so yet can talk to Joanne uh, back there. She'll be glad to help you. And we do have a political roundtable coming on June 12th. That you, almost, you, you can always do that through email or telephone. But in case you want to do it today, Joanne is here to take your, um, uh, your uh, a sign up. Uh, we do have a lot of interesting things happening in the fall. I think I won't take your time now to tell you except to remind you that University for a Day is on September 22nd. And in a time of great uh, constitutional issue turmoil, uh, we have coming back to us Akhil Amar, one of the internationally renowned constitutional scholars talking to us and helping us to uh, walk through uh, with some uh, insights what, what's been going on in, during the past year. We have a very interesting um, former mayor of Palermo in uh, Sicily, Leo Luca Orlando, who, who had the courage to take on the mafia and uh, rid his city of them and lives to tell the story. He's a philosopher and lawyer and a former mayor. And lots more to come, but for now, just thank you for being with us and keep coming. Yes. Could you tell us the logistics for the trip on the 28th? Um, we'll get to you on email about the time. We probably usually we'll probably leave about 7:30 from the circle uh, at, down uh, at the top of Linden Street. The bus will leave from there.